Good morning, Guy. Morning, Maureen. Thank you for inviting us to your offices today at Banque Luxembourg Pleasure. for this new episode of the Perspectives podcast. The new year tends to be the time of year for economic forecasts and predictions, but that's an exercise that you refuse to indulge in, I think. That's correct, yes, because I don't see why why just because a new year is, is starting, you should change your strategy. Uh, and normally this, this, this short-term outlooks, I don't believe in, in this kind of uh, exercise. This, this year was marked by one issue returning to the forefront of discussions, inflation. Even the Fed has apparently hinted at the possibility of an interest rate hike. How do you view the current situation? I think that last year we had this strong rise in inflation and the uh, uh, central banks were telling us that uh, all this was only transitory and, and that uh, inflation should uh, again start to decline later in the year. But uh, the reality is that uh, we ended the year at the uh, highest levels uh, in most regions when it comes to, to, to inflation. And in the meantime, we've seen that the Federal Reserve at least has changed its attitude. I suppose there's some political pressure also mm -hmm. because nine months ago, uh, its President Powell told us that there would be no increase in the uh, Federal Reserve's interest rate before 2023 at the earliest. And now it seems that and the market is already expecting three to four interest rate hikes uh, of the Fed this year, uh, starting in March of this year. Okay. We've just been talking about the Federal Reserve, but it's clear that focus will turn to other monetary authorities, particularly the European Central Bank. What can we expect and what fundamentally would be the ideal response to the current situation? What can we expect? Uh, we, we've had the... Um, uh, the, um, the European Central Bank has already told us that they don't intend to follow the, the Fed and so uh, there will not be any interest rate hike this year, at least according to the, what the European Central Bank itself is saying right now. And the market basically is only expecting a first interest rate hike uh, at, uh, in the second half of next year at the earliest. Um, one has also one has to say that the uh, European Central Bank is less important for the financial markets. Obviously, everybody is looking to the Fed. Ideally, what should happen? Uh, obviously, it's becoming more and more uh, strange to see uh, the European Central Bank uh, continuing with its negative interest rate policy when, in the meantime, we have an inflation rate in the eurozone which is approaching some, which is now around five percent. So. Uh, that seems very strange, uh, but that seems what the European Central Bank seems to be um, inclined to, to continue with this strange monetary policy. Okay. So in this context, um, would you recommend that investors focus on real assets rather than monetary assets? Exactly. I think that uh, uh, we have still uh, in, a, in a situation where interest rates remain very low, and especially when you adjust them for inflation, then you have this negative real interest rate environment, and that's obviously not a very good environment for monetary assets because it means that uh, more and more your, your purchasing power is, is declining over time because uh, basically you have a negative um, yield on your on your savings and in this kind of environments uh, usually you stick you, you should stick to or you should favor real assets like for example equities okay but that means a higher level of volatility volatility clearly yes because uh, stock prices tend to fluctuate much more than bond prices and i would say it's very normal that from time to time uh, you get a uh, correction in the equity markets that's uh, fundamentally something you have to accept if you if you're in equities so it's a price to pay it's a price to pay yeah. um in recent years we've experienced a rather extreme situation as you mentioned with near zero or even negative interest rates and rising corporate earnings can we expect this situation to continue for some while yet yeah, in hindsight, uh, obviously last year was very, very positive and very favorable. The environment was very favorable for equities because in the end, what's important for the equity markets, it's the level of interest rates and it's uh, company earnings. And we had a very strong rebound in, in company earnings last year. And in spite of uh, quite uh, strong growth rates uh, and, and higher inflation, interest rates uh, remained very, very low. So both factors were very positive for equity markets last year. This year, I think we will, it's normal to, to expect a more difficult environment because company earnings should still remain favorable, but we just said uh, interest rates might uh, Fed might increase its interest rate and, and, and bond yields are, are starting to, to, to rise a little bit. So uh, from that side, the environment might become less positive. Okay. But what about index-linked uh, investment policies? So it seems that in recent years, the game has been somewhat distorted when you consider that a tiny number of companies 
can account for a significant weighting in an index due to their market capitalization. Does this mean that this type of investment strategy has its limits? It, at least it means that uh, it's it's becoming more and more dangerous because uh, basically everybody's buying the same stocks. And uh, as you were saying, the, in the S&P 500, you have uh, 1% of the 500 uh, stocks, so 5 to 6 uh, uh, stocks who make up uh, 20% of the index. That's obviously a very dangerous situation. It, it's not a problem as long as the index is rising, but uh, if uh, the index is falling, then it might become a, a problem. And uh, so I, I think index or passive investments or indexing makes sense when the valuation levels are low. Uh, why bother to, to do stock picking if anyway the market is very cheap so you can uh, buy the index but uh, clearly that's not the situation uh, nowadays when, when valuations are quite high. Yeah. So what's the ideal mix of stocks to have in a portfolio? The ideal mix obviously always depends a little bit also on on, on the investment in investors' uh, ability to to we were talking about these corrections etc to to withstand these corrections, uh, but I uh, clearly I think the the, the environment still uh, that's an environment where you st- should still favour stocks if you can. Uh, withstand a certain volatility, um, but within the stock market, I think it's more becoming more and more um, important to have an active approach and not simply buying the index, but within the uh, markets to look at uh, uh, interesting companies, quality companies, where the valuation might uh, might still be reasonable. And it's obviously becoming more and more difficult up after last year's uh, strong rise in stock prices or even the last 10 years rise in stock prices, but it's still possible. Hmm. What about the geographical split? Europe Europe and US account for the vast majority of global market capitalization. Are there good opportunities in other markets, like Asia, for example? Yeah, I think, and, and that's one of our investment uh, themes uh, nowadays, is that maybe you should... Uh, um, switch a little bit more from the west to the east in the, in the sense that, uh, uh, as you were saying, the U.S. stock market nowadays makes up some 60% of the world market capitalization. And in Europe, uh, quality companies have also become quite expensive. Uh, what still looks cheap in, 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 in Europe are the so-called value sectors, but these are typically not sectors we uh, will invest in because, again, they say, uh, they say of much less quality. And the quality companies in Europe are expensive. Uh, expensive too so um, and on the contrary in in Asia the Asian markets have underperformed over the last years and and uh, if you, so if you you're willing to uh, be a little bit more contrarian then uh, normally you, you look uh, where did you look uh, you, you are going to invest in companies and regions where maybe the uh, um, which are a little bit out of favor because uh, by definition that's where you, you you tend to find more opportunities yeah we always end these podcasts by looking at the case for gold. So people always think about the precious metal itself, but they tend to overlook gold mining companies. There might be some nuggets in there, if you excuse the pun. I would say so, yes. I, uh, first of all, I think that the environment for gold is still positive because uh, gold tends to do well in an environment of negative interest rates, uh, negative real interest rates, and I, I think we're still very much in, in such an environment. So that's positive for gold. And within the uh, gold uh, sector, you have gold companies, uh, whether it's produ- gold producers or royalty companies, which um, have sometimes suffered quite a bit uh, over the last years, sometimes last year, and where you can find some very interesting companies, yes. Okay, so it's a good asset to have in a, a div- diversified portfolio. Yes, I would say so. Okay. Well, thank you, Guy, for your time today. Thank you. um, For sharing your analysis with us. Uh, Take care and see you soon. Thank you, Maureen.